Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Walsh, Company Alive from the Illinois Fire Service Institute. We're going to give you a chance to sign on here and get your screen all squared away. And then today I'll be joined by Jeff Kraft, Lieutenant on the Chicago Fire Department, and we'll be talking tick cameras here on the firehouse floor. We'll see you in a minute. Afternoon, everybody. How are you? Nice to see you again. Tim Walsh and Jeff Kraft coming to you live from the firehouse floor here at the Illinois Fire Service Institute. A couple of housekeeping items before I turn the floor over to Jeff. Remember, for uh, following along today's class, we have a handout already printed on the portal page. Uh, you can log in to uh, www.fsi.illinois.edu, click on the portal page and you'll be able to find the handout for today's class so you can follow along. You can print those off or you can use your phone. Also, make sure you post in comments where you're watching from and any questions that you have, I'll be handling questions and working with Jeff to get that done. Also, we wanted to remind you that we'll be doing probably a live feed every week. Uh, next week, April 30th, we're gonna be joined by uh, Chief Tom Schubert and Chief Ron Raines. We'll be doing rural command uh, from the dirty classroom. So we, first we wanted to thank our sponsors, actually our vendors that work with us. Today we're going to be talking about tick cameras. So there are many tick cameras on the market. We have all of them here today. We have MSA, we have Fleur, we have Bullard, we have Seek, and we have Scott. So these are all the cameras that we use on the fire ground when we're teaching class. And our partners are kind enough to be able to allow us to use them so that when you come down for a class either as a firefighter or a company officer, you can utilize these cameras and make a decision when you go back home as to which camera you want to use. Like any tool on the fire ground, a camera is only as good as its operator. Each have a little bit different tools that they can use and how you want to use them on the fire ground, so you need to test them before you decide. And you probably need to create a committee to determine what you want to do. Some old guys, some young guys, some officers, and maybe even a chief if you're brave enough to get him or her on the committee with you. So without any further interpretation, I'm going to turn the day over to Jeff, and I'll be coming in and off the screen. Please uh, post in the comments section, and we'll get going here. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Timmy. And thank you for taking the opportunity to spend the next hour or so with us going over the thermal imaging cameras. We have video that we have posted on the porthole that I'm probably going to refer to five or six times during this uh, lecture portion of it. So when this is all said and done, we expect you to go and look at that video and use that for training and give the information to the firefighters that you work with. This thermal imaging class has been under, uh, the net last two or three years we've been changing it a handful of times and a lot of it came from students who gave information back to us on what it should be. When we first decided to update the information that's being delivered on the thermal imaging cameras, 
We turned it into a four-hour program. We gave an hour's worth of lecture, and we gave three hours of hands-on. After delivering that four or five times, we got enough information back from the students that they wanted a lot more hands-on with the cameras. We took that information, we were able to make it into an eight-hour program. We then again delivered it another three or four times. We got more information back from the students saying we need more hands-on time. We then turned it into a 12-hour program. We put them in three to four different buildings in that nine to 10 hours that they're in the buildings and give them situations where they're rescuing civilians, rescuing firefighters, going into situations so they can understand the thermal layers in the buildings and how it's affecting the camera, what the colors mean on the camera, and how you're gonna be able to dissect that information while you're doing this. If you're interested after you watch this next hour on going through one of those programs, we deliver this at Fire College. That'll be in October this year, so please take the time out and, and look at the programs that we're gonna be delivering then. We do do it during Winter Fire School, and we also do it during the Explorers program. So there's many opportunities that you have to be able to experience the hands-on portion of this with the classroom. As you see in front of us, you would see a bunch of cameras that you're gonna have the opportunity to use if you go through that program. What we want you to do is get your hands on every single camera that we have here, get an idea of how they work and what they do, but we also want you to spend as much time as possible with the camera you have at home. The sets and reps you're gonna get with that camera is gonna build confidence when you are at home using those cameras in your daily duties as a firefighter. Hopefully, it'll build that efficiency and you'll be able to take that opportunity to build off of that program and teach those younger firefighters how to use that, the, the TIC camera. Okay, just to remind everybody, the handout is now in the comments section on the Facebook Live uh, feed that you're watching. You can click on that to follow along with uh, Jeff while he talks, and you can print those off later to use in uh, night training, later, maybe later on tonight or later on in the week. So we wanted to make sure that you had that available to you. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. No, that's great, Jimmy, thank you. When you get home and you are looking at the camera that you have on the rig, we don't want you to be the guy that's capable of turning the camera on but really doesn't know how it works. Some of the cameras are very basic, and there's nothing wrong with that. The four or $500 cameras that you have the opportunity to use is, is honestly a good camera that we can use in the fire service. But there's more expensive cameras that have lots of bells and whistles on it. It's a piece of equipment that we really have to be professional about and be able to use all of those throughout uh, the ability of using the cameras. We need to be able to break down when and how to be able to use those to benefit us while we're working in the fire service. I wish I could tell you everything you needed to know about the camera that you're using at home. We don't have the time to do that because there's so many different ones out there. So you need to do the research and the homework on it. You need to put into the work and understand everything you possibly can about the camera that's sitting on your apparatus. Then what you need to do is teach the others that you work with. It doesn't matter if just the officer or one firefighter knows how to do this. We need to make sure that everyone who has the possibility of touching the cameras is going to have the knowledge on what they do and how it's going to be the most benefit to use them. A little history on that. We went to a larger department who was giving chief officers cameras for their apparatus. When we went there, it was the same cameras that the officers were using when they were lieutenants and captains. They were a little upset when we came in there. They said, what do I need the class for? I've been using this camera for the last five, 10 years. When we got done with the program, they looked at us for a good portion of them and said, thank you. There's a lot of things that this camera does that I really never knew about that no one ever taught me. We also had to the other extreme. We went to a couple other departments. We uh, gave the class over a three day period. Over that three day period on the third day, one of the members came back to us and said, hey, we are one of those departments that really didn't take the camera off the rig. We had a fire last night. While we were at the fire, we were having a lot of issues finding the fire. One of the guys said, why don't we go and grab the camera off the rig and try what they taught us in the class. They took the camera into the building. They said within two to three minutes, they were able to find where the fire was and put it out. So we can give you beneficial information that it can assist you and make firefighting a little bit easier and a little bit more helpful for you. Now let's talk about the type of people who are actually holding the cameras. Usually there's three types. There's the guy who has it on his gear or on his uh, air pack all the time, but really doesn't know how to use it and never lifts it up and actually looks at the camera. 
There's the guy like I just told you about for that one department. They don't even take it off the grid. It's a tool that they have that they're not really sure how to use and what's the most benefits ways of using it. So they leave it on the rig because they're not comfortable with it. And then there's the few handful of people who got it. They understand what the camera is, how they're going to use it, and how it's gonna benefit them in the fire service. That's what we want all of us to get comfortable and become with, where you're the guy who has it and understands how it's gonna benefit you. Think of if we didn't have the cameras. It'd be a big complaint we had about our department or the village or the city we work for. We have them. So it's our responsibility to understand how to use them and how it's gonna benefit us. Think about what you know about different things in the fire service, handline, ladders, your SCBA. Most of us have a story for everything that we use in the fire service. If you don't have a thermal imaging camera story, you're probably not using it often enough or know enough about it that you're gonna be able to give that information to someone else. When you show up for roll call in the morning, one of the things that you should do once you get your gear in place, once you check your air pack, is you should be checking your camera. You should be turning it on, making sure that you have a full battery. You should have an extra battery possibly on the apparatus with you if it doesn't charge on the rig. Think about what it does and check all the little gadgets that may be on the camera. Is it working? Show it and when you're looking at it, show it to the other firefighters, how you're getting the readings and what those little things do. Make sure all of the things on the, the camera are working and make sure the connector that's gonna hold your camera in place works and isn't frayed or, or tear. When I first got a camera, we didn't have connectors. For the department that I was on at the time, we kept the camera in our hand. What that did as an officer was, it made me pretty unproductive because one of my hands always had the camera. The last thing I wanted to do was put the camera down and lose it because it's an expensive thing to lose. There's other options that are out there. Some people will connect seat belts to it or longer straps where the camera hangs lower on them. I'm not as big of a fan of that because I like the camera high on me so it's easier to grab and closer to my face. I also like it having the gear keeper on it. I know not too long ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, there was a conversation on Facebook where people were talking about that they didn't like those gear keepers because they can, they can break. In my personal opinion, that's what I want. If the camera gets caught on something, I would rather have that break than me be caught up in having to work to try to get myself out of what I'm caught into. The other thing that you need to understand and know is turning on your camera. How long does it take your camera to warm up? How long does it need, once you press that on button, to show you the information that it needs to know? One of the things that I do is on the way to the fire scene, I turn my camera on. The big reason why I do that, not only does it let it warm up, but the cameras that we have in our apparatus, I cannot turn on with a gloved hand. I would have to take my glove off. Me taking my glove off at the front of the building or as I'm walking up to the fire seat slows me down and takes away my attention from where it needs to be. Think about maintenance for your cameras. Maybe they had a fire the night before and they didn't clean it up. Follow what the manufacturer recommends for keeping your camera clean. Two areas I definitely want clean on my camera are the front screen and the back screen on the camera. If I have those dirty or full of muck or drywall, it's gonna prevent me from getting a clear image and possibly not be able to see the heat signatures that I need on that camera. It's not recommended that you submerge these cameras to clean them. So make sure you use a mild soap, uh, brush them off, clean them off, wipe them on down so they're nice and clean and ready to go to work for you. Let's talk a little bit about now how we're gonna use the camera and what are gonna be the best areas to use that camera. One of them is searching. Timmy brought up already, we're gonna talk about orientated search with the camera. And I can tell you that isn't something that I learned until probably six, seven years ago about using the camera for an orientated search. As an officer, what I would do on a regular basis is I would scan the room, I would get a good layout of the room, and then I would send the firefighter in there to search it. He didn't have a clue what the layout of the room is because I didn't let him see the camera. The other good positive about doing an orientated search with the camera is I use less air. That's an important thing right now because by using less air, with the new standards for the SCBAs that are out there, instead of us having a quarter, we're up to a third, which means we have less time in the building. When you have lower manpower and less air, we've gotta get the searches done quicker. 
when I enter the building, one of the things that I can do is I get a better visual of what's going on inside the structure. Things that can give me information while I'm in the building. If I scan the room and I see a wheelchair in the corner, that's gonna give me a good suggestion that I probably have someone who's gonna need assistance getting out of the building. They're probably still in the building if I didn't see them on the front lawn because their wheelchair is still inside the structure. Think of bunk beds. Sometimes bunk beds are missed when firefighters are doing that primary search because we didn't check above. If that firefighter knows going into that bedroom that there's bunk beds, he's gonna do that search faster for that upper bunk and not miss that. Cribs can throw us off a little bit too. When you have a crib in the room, acknowledge it to the firefighter so they know because they need to pull that crib towards them so they can do the search a little bit easier. Hey, Jeff, a couple things that we wanted to talk about that you passed up just because uh, there's a lot of things to talk about. This is an old school lanyard that some fire departments are using. Uh, Jeff talked about the breakaway lanyards that uh, fall off and break if you get caught up on something. This is okay in a pinch, but this is very strong material. This is paracord, and it will not break. So if you get tied up on this, you could have a problem inside the fire building. So we don't recommend that you use this. We keep this on this, different cameras. We switch them around so that we train like we really play. The other thing we want to do is we want to thank Heron Fire Protection District for jumping on today. Their whole department is watching. This is a great opportunity for you guys to sit at the kitchen table, have a cup of coffee, send in your questions, and talk about what we're doing here. If we don't talk about the tools that we work with on a daily basis, talk about going to fires. We're not taking care of each other. We're not taking care of the next generation. So keep up the good work here in Fire Protection District, and we look forward to your questions. Sorry to interrupt you. No, thank you, Timmy. That's great. Again, when we're using our camera, we're trying to acknowledge what is going on in the building and what is happening. One of the great drills that you can take your firefighters out and do and show them heat signatures with your camera is go to any of your businesses that have a machine room. If you take that camera and you point it at the door of that machine room, you're gonna have a lightness or a whiteness that comes around the outside of the door. That's gonna show that there's a heat signature on the other side of the door. Now, does that mean that there's a fire? Absolutely not. We have to interpret the information that the camera is giving us. It is letting us know that on the other side of the door, it is hotter. That's all the information it's giving us. Now, we have to take that information and find out why. Well, there's an important reason, that's a machine room. In that room, it's probably 10 to 20 to 30 degrees hotter in that room because the machines are running on that closed door area. So we can give that information and show our young firefighters what it looks like in the camera when something is hotter. When we talk about how the camera takes in information, what we need to understand is it is measuring the surface temperatures on the object. Each object is gonna take in surface temperatures at a different rate. So if I have a piece of metal in the room, I have wood in the room, and I have cotton in the room, the piece of metal is probably going to take in that heat signature faster and be warmer. So that's gonna be the white thing in the room because it's gonna be the hottest out of the, all of the things that may be in that room. So remember the white colors are going to show the hottest. On the bay floor in the morning, your firefighter is gonna be the hottest thing in that room if you point your camera at the firefighter. But once we're in the building, it's not going to be. We're gonna be darker colors once we're inside the structure. So everything takes in heat at a different rate. When, when we are working with our cameras and we are looking at how our cameras work and what they have on them, one of the important things to remember with your camera is on the side, usually the right side of most cameras, there's a temperature gauge. It usually gives the number in the bottom right on what that temperature is. All, most, if not all of the new cameras have temperatures where they show colors also on that camera. You need to jump in there, buddy? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. So a couple things. So we had one question about what's the max distance that a camera can see. And we're gonna get into that in a few minutes when we talk about water rescues and using the camera in a water rescue. Uh, each manufacturer's length on distance is different. So I would refer to your manufacturer guidelines on what camera you're using based upon that answer. Also. If you have a camera in your possession right now, if it's out on the apparatus floor, go get that camera and pass it around the table, turn it on, and actually use it while we're talking during the class. This is what we do while we're teaching this in the classroom during uh, fire college and during winter fire school. So you should have a camera in your hand while we're talking about it so you can see the limitations and the benefits of the camera that you have. Thanks, Timmy. 
So again, when we're looking at our camera and the information that it gives us on the camera, on the right hand side is the temperature gauge. Usually in the lower right hand corner, it's gonna give you what that temperature is. The other thing the newer cameras do, it gives you colors. And for most cameras, not all, that temperature is surface temperature. So if you and I are crawling down a hallway and I take that camera and I point it at the ceiling and in that camera, in the visual that I see on my camera, I'm seeing the ceiling and two walls. It's gonna average out the temperatures. So if the ceiling is 600 degrees, the walls are 400 degrees, I'm gonna get a temperature of 500 degrees on the camera. Now does that mean that's what the smoke temperature or the heat temperature is in, in that area? Absolutely not. That's what the color information is gonna give me. So as I point it at that ceiling, I now need to also look at the colors. And that's, that colors is gonna tell me what that smoke is or that flow above my head is. If I see yellows, which isn't uncommon, that's gonna be around the 500 degree range. Oranges and reds is where I'm gonna start getting worried. At 800 degrees, I'm gonna start seeing oranges. We can start getting to, temp to, to flashover temperatures just above the 800 degree range. So that's where I need to come up with a plan. What am I gonna do to make it better? Is there a door I can close? Is there a way I'm gonna be able to uh, cool down that area with the line that's with me? Or do I need to back out and come up with plan B on how we're gonna get to that area that's on fire? Just like Jeff is saying, the camera is a tool, right? So we wanna be able to have plan A, plan B, plan C when we're operating in the IDLH hazard. So you need to be flowing water. If we learned anything over the last few years through the studies done by UL, NITS, and the Illinois Fire Service Institute is that flowing water is critical to you making rescues and be able to operate inside that IDLH hazard. So you have to have a hose line with you when you're searching, you need to be flowing water, and you need to anticipate the conditions are gonna get bad. Most fires are vent limited, and when we open a door or we open a window to get into that building, to get into that room, to make a rescue and to make a search, now we're introducing air into that building and the fire is gonna grow. Please go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Tim. At every fire, we should not be surprised to see oranges and reds. If you have a fire burning in a bedroom, you're gonna get 800, 900 degrees in that room. That's not surprising, but that's not a room that I should be searching until that I'm able to cool it off. There are other areas I can search, there's things I can do to keep it cool. So don't be surprised when you see temperatures above 1,000 degrees. We're going to see that for buildings that are on fire. We just have to dissect and interpret that information so we can make the right choices on where we're gonna put our firefighters to start our searches. We have to remember that camera really doesn't tell us anything. We have to interpret what information it gives us and we have to break it down. Things to remember with the camera. Cameras don't give us the ability to walk around even if it's a cold smoke fire. We still have to stay low because we cannot see. We're gonna get into reasons why we still need to crawl in a little bit but we need to remember we still need to stay low even though the camera is giving a, us a layout of the room. The other important thing that the camera does is it gives us landmarks. So we still have to do our regular search patterns and stay on a left wall or right wall while we're going into a building. But it's important to remember that that camera can malfunction, it's a tool. If I don't follow my landmarks, I don't stay along the wall and get an idea of what the layout of that room is, I can get lost and un unable to get back to the area that I was because I didn't do it the correct way. But the oriented search part of this program that Jeff is gonna be covering and we've talked about a little bit, the camera allows the officer or who's ever operating the camera to fan out his search crew in a more quick manner and be able to monitor that search and direct them to victims that he sees initially from the camera while sharing the camera screen with his partners. So this camera, any tick camera, whatever brand you get it from, will make you more effective, will make you faster, it will allow you to save lives. And that's why we all got into this business, was to make that grab, make that rescue. So you have to be familiar with its use and IDLH hazards, and your crew has to be familiar with it. Not one person holds the camera. Everybody gets a look, and we'll show you that later. But start thinking big picture here. Get the blinders off your head, and allow everybody to operate with that camera. Another really important thing that makes us work faster in a fire building is the camera will acknowledge thermal flow that's happening above our head. When we're not sure whether we need to go left or we need to go right, that thermal flow will give us the information on which way to send that engine company so they're gonna be able to get water on the fire so we can conduct our searches faster and things can get into a better temperature and easier to do the things we need to do for the searches. 
So we need to remember with the cameras, it's not an exact science. When it comes to the camera giving us information on those numbers, it's giving an approximate temperature. It's not going to tell you it's exactly 820 degrees above your head. It's going to be around those circumstances. One of the handouts that we gave you on the porthole is the information on how we're going to uh, be able to break down what that camera does and how it reads the temperatures. When I point it at a cabinet, and the cabinet reads 100 degrees, whether it's 95 degrees or 105 degrees really doesn't matter. We know it's around 100 degrees. There has been some talk about using cameras to be able to put on a person and point it, point it in that direction to try to get a temperature off of them. Per the manufacturers, our cameras aren't made to do that. A person being 95 degrees or 105 degrees is a big difference. Whether my cabinet is at 95 or 105 degrees really doesn't matter. Another benefit that the camera can do is it can help us to try to figure out where that fire is when we're in a hallway. If I point it at five doors and one of the doors is hot, that information can let me know that's probably the first door that I need to check. It's, it's an important thing to be able to go to the hottest area first, check and see if that's where the fire is before we go in, in further areas. Hey, another great use for the camera, and we had a question about it, is performing that 360. So we've looked at uh, duty death reports from NIOSH from all across the country. We should be looking at those and study how firefighters die in the line of duty so that we don't make those mistakes again. And the 360 is huge in almost every line of duty death report. That tick camera, whichever one you're using, a Fleur, a Bullard, a Scott, an MSA, should be taken out of the rig upon your initial assignment. As soon as you get on the, on the fire ground, who's ever doing that 360, take that camera with you. Take a look at the building. It's going to show you more from the outside, and you'll be able to better direct companies that are working on the fire ground to go directly to the fire. It's a really great tool on the 360, and as Jeff was saying, it's a really great tool on the inside of the building, which you'll see in the video a little later. You'll see heat waves, you'll see radiation, and you'll be able to find the fire much quicker. The more you use the tool, the better you get at it. We're going to get into talking about the limitations that cameras have now, and that's one of the biggest things that I want you to look into and investigate with your cameras. All of these cameras do great work, and the companies that are giving us this information and delivering and giving us the classes on these cameras, they let us know all the awesome things that these cameras do. We then need to investigate, we need to figure out what are the limitations for the camera and what doesn't it do. One of the things that the UL and NIST did the studies on because firefighters were getting themselves in trouble was we were using that camera and we were entering that first floor and we were pointing it at the floor trying to see what temperatures were in the basement. We were getting 80, 90 degrees at the floor. What was really happening in the basement when they did the studies is they were finding out you could have temperatures of 1200 degrees in the basement and only get an 80 or 90 reading on that first floor. It's no different in the attic or the cock loft area. That camera is not an x-ray machine. It's not going to see through things for us. So we have to make sure we open it up or check those areas before we commit ourselves. I don't belong on the first floor until I make sure I check that basement and make sure there's no fire below it before I commit myself or my company to that first floor. We talked a little bit about how the cameras turn on and off. I brought up for me one of the limitations that I have with my cameras. I cannot turn a camera on with a gloved hand. So I make sure that camera's turned on before that I get off the apparatus. We talked a little bit er earlier about being in cold smoke while we're walking around. One of the firefighters that we talked to when, we, when we, we did this class explained to us that he was in a warehouse. They had a cold smoke fire. He was in the back of the warehouse and he was walking on the dock area trying to look for heat signatures. This firefighter walked right off the loading dock area because the camera will not give depth perception. It will not tell you whether th there is a difference in the levels of the floors and the other big part about it is you need to remember holes and water puddles look exactly the same on the camera. When we show you the video later, you're going to see that water looks exactly like a hole on the floor. You can get false readings when you enter an area because of baseboard heat. So it can show you that those areas are hotter in that room even though you don't have fire. Again, we need to investigate. 
We can't assume that just because we're getting a heat signature that something is on fire. We can also use that in the opposite way though. Probably about a month and a half ago for me, we had a single story residence that we had fire, um, heavy smoke coming out. We uh, made a force entry for the front door. While we were making force entry for the front door, there was other companies working to get and gain access to the basement area. When I took that camera and I scanned that first floor, on the left-hand side, there was a section that looked hot. On the right-hand side, there was a section that looked hot. Those were the heating vents. That let me know before we committed to the first floor that there was heat in the basement. So we waited for that company to get into the basement, cool that area, before we committed ourselves to the first floor. Now, did we have fire in the walls? Did we have fire in the clock, cock loft area? Yes, it rolled up those areas in there. But we didn't commit to that first floor because we knew we had fire in the basement. So we had a question from Keith Ballow about commercial buildings and operating the tick camera in the, in the upper portions of a 14 to 20 foot ceiling. So if I'm using, let's say, the Bullard camera on this demonstration, and I'm entering a commercial structure, and Jeff's gonna talk about this in a little while, there's different patterns that we can use. We can go high, medium, and low. We can use the Z pattern to get a good look. But in a commercial building, you wanna be very cognizant of what is happening above your head. You wanna use the camera to check to see if the fire is in the structural members. If the fire's in the structural members, most commercial buildings are lightweight constructed or they're steel barred joist truss. We know that's a no-go situation if we have a large volume of fire in a commercial building like that. So this tool, this camera, whichever one we use, maybe it's a Fleur, maybe it's a Scott, is a tool to be able to make those fire ground decisions in a commercial building on whether or not it's a no-go situation or it's defensive or it's offensive. So that's a great question, Keith. We appreciate it. Happy birthday, Keith, by the way. Um, so other things we need to remember about the cameras is we need to interpret the information that it's giving us. Again, the camera's not telling us anything that we can't try to figure out from that point. So when you see something that's warm, take that information, try and break it down, and find out why that area is hot. Doesn't always mean that there's a fire. We're gonna go back to that cold smoke that we were talking about. If you're in something like a Home Depot or a Menards and you have a sprinkler head that's going off and you take that camera and you point it at where that sprinkler head is going off, you need to remember that the camera will not see through the water. So you could have massive fire going on on the other side of it. Doesn't always mean you're gonna be able to see what's happening. So I may need to go to the left or go to the right to be able to see what's going on around it. We talked about average temperatures. Again, this camera is not like a thermometer that you would use to take your kid's temperature. This camera is going to give you estimated temperatures that are gonna be close to that reading. And for us, on what we're trying to get readings on, that's gonna be okay. When we are looking at carpeting, wood floors, or roofing material, again, the camera's not an x-ray machine. It's not gonna see through those areas. We're gonna need to open them up, get an idea of what's going on on the other side of it to be able to assess whether we need to put fire, firefighters in that area or if it's a clear area. We need to think about with cameras, they will pick up reflective surfaces. For the Chicagoland area, one of the big things we still see in basements is paneling. What people do with paneling to make it look nice is they put pledge on it. What is pledge? Pledge is a wax that you're gonna put on it. If you're in a basement, you can get a area that looks almost like a mirror that's showing that fire may be in front of you, even though it's to the side of you, because it's, it's actually getting a mirror image off of that panel. Think of the plastic strips that are in a cold storage area, the strips that come down to keep the cool out and the, and the hot out. That area with those strips is not gonna be able to be seen through with the camera. It's gonna prevent you from knowing what's going on on the other side. So you're gonna have to open those up to get a view of what's happening. Metal plate covers that you're gonna have on your outlets. Again, you're gonna get a mirror image off of that plate cover. It's not gonna let you know. In the video, we show you a piece of plexiglass. And in that, we cover a firefighter up halfway on the bottom, then halfway on the top. When we lift it up to the top, you can actually see the mirror image of the person who's taking the video off of that. An important thing to remember is if you're ever using the camera and you see a mirror image of what looks like a firefighter, the important thing to do at that point is to wave. If that firefighter waves back at you, you know it's a mirror image that it's not another firefighter in the building. 
Now we need to take the time and we need to check on the other side of it to see if it's a room or it's an area that needs to be checked. When we're checking bathrooms, again, reflective images for your plumbing walls, any type of tile is going to give you that mirror image and we're not gonna be able to see what's on the other side of it. Sunlight can trick us too. Whether we are looking at a window or a door, sunlight coming into a window or door can actually make it look like there's two of them. And I can guarantee you with my luck, I'm gonna bump my head into the one that's actually the mirror image and not the one that's giving the sunlight that comes through it. So we had an additional question about the time that it takes for the camera to readjust. So this is a first generation Scott Tick camera and we know these are out on the street all across the country and all across the state of Illinois. It depends on your funding issue, right? Whether or not you can buy a newer, next generation camera, the best Scott on the market, the best MSA, your cameras might be old, they might be in disrepair. So yes, an older camera will take a little bit longer to reset as you scan the room. So your scanning technique needs to slow down. And what actually happens on the screen is, the screen will almost go blank for about a nanosecond, and then it'll come back on and you should see a different screen. So you need to allow that screen to reset based upon the age of your camera, and that information again is found in your individual camera books for whatever camera model you're using. Thanks for that question. And it's a good question and that's okay. Just as long as, again, I did the research, I've played with my camera enough, I understand the information that it's giving me, and I understand that I need to move a little bit slower. Heat will cause that camera to lock up a little bit more. And if I'm paying attention to the screen and I see that that screen locks up or it, it doesn't allow that picture to keep moving, then I know I gotta go back to the right or to the left a little bit and I need to slow down my scan and I need to recheck that area I've made a locked up on. When we talk about the older cameras, uh, we used to have major issues with some, with some of those things. When you would get a whiteout on a screen, that camera would need time to reset before it was able to give you a decent picture. For the cameras that we carried uh, back before we got the ones that are on the apparatus now, for me, we had uh, cameras that the batteries would wear out in 15 minutes. It was very common for us officers to carry batteries in our pockets while we were working because 15 minutes into the fire, I may need to change the battery. If you know that, you can work around it. We need to under, uh, understand, regardless of how old your camera is also, thermal layers have an effect on how well that camera is going to be able to give you information. The more information that I can deliver to myself and my crew before water is placed on the fire, the better off we're going to be in the building. Once we disrupt those thermal layers, especially with as thick as the smoke is now because of what is burning, modern versus legacy, when we have uh, the modern burning, that smoke is so thick, that black smoke, it's got so much product in it, once it drops to where we're at, we're not gonna be able to see as well what's going on. So now let's talk about how we're gonna use the camera, what's the best way we're gonna be able to take that information in to make us do our jobs faster, safer, and easier. The biggest thing is searching for victims. Now when we're searching for victims, when I'm going to search for, uh, with my crew into the bedroom area of a house, one of the big things that we have brought up already was the orientated search. When I'm doing an orient orientated search as a firefighter and as an officer, when I get to that room as the officer, I wanna take this camera and I wanna scan the room. I'm gonna do a Z pattern. I'm gonna scan high on the room. I'm looking for heat signatures. I'm looking for colors. And if I got oranges and reds that are above us, I'm not gonna send that firefighter in to do that search. I'm gonna close that room door and I'm gonna wait for that line to get in there. Cool that area down before we send that firefighter in there to do the search. But if I scan the room and we have no oranges or reds above the head, I'm gonna then go to the six foot level. What am I looking for at the six foot level? A basic layout of the room and I'm also looking for other ways out, other doors. Maybe I, I see where the closet is with the room. I see where the window is across from the doorway that we're entering. Then I'm gonna scan low. That gives me a basic layout of the room, and where I might see a down firefighter, I might see a down victim, and I've got a basic layout of the room. So from the doorway, I probably have a good scan of at least 60% of the room. Now if I allow that firefighter to come up next to me, and I hold that camera in my hand, and he puts his hand, or she puts his hand on it also, he, he or she scans high, scans medium, scans low. 
And I'm gonna apologize up front. It's, I know that there's women that work in the fire service too. It's he or she, it's a bad habit of mine and I apologize. Um, I, you'll probably catch me doing it one or two more times while we go through this. By me being able to have that firefighter come up next and scan the room with me, that firefighter knows it only needs to check about 40% of the room now. The closet, underneath the bed, the other side of the bed, maybe on the other side of the dresser. Again, we're saving air. We're not in the room as long as we need to be. One of the things that's talked about a lot too is do you take the tool in the room? There's different beliefs and philosophies on that. For your typical eight by 10 bedroom, my personal belief is if I leave the tool by the door, I can search the room a little bit faster and it also shows me the way out of that room, which door I came in. We can use the camera for overhaul. I can use that camera, scan a wall. I can find out which area of the wall is the hottest. If we open that part up and there's no fire in there, there's a real good chance there's no fire in the other sections of the wall and I'm not gonna have to open up three or four different bays. Timmy talked a little bit about it already, how we're gonna use it for size up. For your typical frame home, if I walk up to the outside of the building and I scan the windows, one of the tells if there's fire on the other side of the window, if you scan five windows, one window looks fuzzier than the other windows, there's a real good chance that, that is the room that the fire is gonna be in. Other parts of that is for a frame home, I can look at what the two by fours look like from the outside of the structure. Start practicing that when you're doing your size up. Take the time to look and see the stability of the home. Is that something we should be going into or should we be going defensive right away? A lot of the information I can get from the outside of the structure. When we talk about at the, at the beginning of an incident, using that camera to get, get as much information as possible, it can change what our tactics are gonna be and how easy that search is gonna be able to be com completed. It can make sure we get those firefighters closest to the seat of the fire to start those searches and get an idea of what is happening on that floor before we commit them to other areas of the building. We realize that most fire departments in the state of Illinois and across the country are rural fire departments and your manpower is a consideration. This is a manpower multiplier. This allows the company officer or the chief officer to who's ever in the building running that fire to quickly scan a large piece of the building and direct his manpower where it needs to go. So it's very important for you to do that. You need to be able to look at the building and see the conditions and direct your manpower. And when companies are only pulling up with two or three members on that truck, on that engine, like I said before, this is a force multiplier. You need to use it and you need to play with it both in fake smoke, cold smoke, because heat signatures will still show up then, and in live fire conditions to get good at it. Jeff? When Timmy talks about live fire conditions, one of the things that that camera can help us with is rollover. Rollover used to be seen when legacy, was bur legacy type of uh, furniture was burning, you used to be able to see it above your head. You don't see rollover as much nowadays because the smoke is so thick and black. The camera will give you that information. It'll let you know that you have rollover above your head. What are my, one of my concerns with rollover? Rollover could be an indication that a flashover is gonna happen very soon. Again, that gives me the time to get my crew to either a safe area or I need to cool down that area before we continue forward uh, in that structure. Remember when you're doing searches throughout that building and you see a heat signature in a room. I talked about the heating vents that I saw. I needed to verify what was going on underneath me and just not assume that there was fire on that first floor. Let's say you see a heat signature under a bed while you're doing a search. What is it? It's your responsibility as the firefighter doing that search to find out. Maybe it's a heating vent that's underneath the bed. Maybe it's a dog. Maybe it's a kid hiding. That's your responsibility to take that information and identify what is going on in that area. We're gonna talk a little bit about water rescue and how water rescue and the camera can be used to benefit and make it easier for us to find that down person. So I know you haven't thought about this in a long time probably, and you might not go to that many water rescues, but it should be one of the first tools off the engine or truck when you pull up on the scene, or even out of the chief's buggy. And the reason is, especially at nighttime, you'll be able to see a civilian out in the water, or maybe even another firefighter if you're in the middle of a water rescue, and you'll be able to locate their 
location pretty quickly. Uh, the camera sees pretty far, several hundred yards during calm conditions, depending on the make and model of the camera that you're using. But during a water rescue, and then just gonna talk a little bit about hazmat as well, how we can check vessel tanks and container size and see if there's product left in the tanks. So it's a tool to use on the fire ground. It's also a tool to use for all your specialized rescues that you go to. We know that fire departments are an all hazard agency now and you get called for everything. Use the tool in the toolbox. The engine is a toolbox, so is the truck. Make sure you know your tools. Jeff? Factors you gotta remember when you're using your camera for water rescue is if that person goes underneath the water at all, they're not gonna see any of their body part that's underneath the water. Depending on how long that they have been in the water also, if the temperature of their upper body gets to the point where it's the same temperature as the water, you're not gonna be able to tell where they're at using the camera. So the earlier we can get that camera and get an acknowledgement on where they are in the water, the better chance we are to be able to do a rescue. Now distances when we talk about cameras and how far they're able to see. Again, that's something you need to talk to your manufacturer about and find out. There's an overall average that it's good to about 400 feet giving us information. Anything after that, and we're not going to be able to get very accurate readings off of that camera. Jeff talked about it earlier, but we had a question come up again. How reliable is the camera if it's a heavy-duty door, such as a commercial door or a dorm room door? Uh, you'll be able to see, because the door isn't sealed that tightly, around the inside edge of the door, where the jam is, whether there's heat behind it or not. Now, is it a true indicator of fire? No, the camera is just a tool. The tool allows you to see that the temperature on the back side of the door, around the edge, or at the floor level, where there's always space, is higher than the room that you're in. So is it always the answer that yes, there's a fire there? No, it's not. It could be a machine room, it could be an elevator room, it could be electrical heat from electrical arcing on an electrical cabinet, it could be a multitude of things. So it's not going to show you everything, but it will give you clues as to where you need to go. With that, you can also, for an exterior door, if it has a peephole, one of the things you can do if you are getting a heat signature on the other side of the door, pop that peephole out. Get an idea of a reading of what's happening on the other side of the door. If you have heavy smoke push out of that peephole or fire push out of the peephole, it's giving you information before you commit yourself to opening that door. It buys you the time to be able to get yourself and what you need in place before you decide to move on to that next thing. As an officer, when you're using the camera, let's take a situation. While you're in the building, Think of how much easier things can be if you're using that camera in the proper way. I can get a layout of the floor and what's gonna be the easiest way to get to maybe where that firefighter is. If they're up to a second floor or down a basement staircase, it'll be easier for me to find the staircase and get to where that down firefighter is. Once I get to that floor and I find where that down firefighter is, my responsibility as the writ officer is to go past where that down firefighter is. Now, from the area that I'm at, I can watch what my company's doing in the camera. I can give them directions while I'm giving a radio report and I'm out of the way. Once they're ready to leave and they package that firefighter up and he's ready to go, I can then move around where those firefighters are working and I can lead them out with the camera, paying attention to where we're going and how those firefighters are moving and pay attention and keep track of, of my car on which firefighters are with me and how we're gonna be able to get out of the building. Let's talk a little bit about hazmat and containers. For containers to work and for containers to be able to, to be used where I'm taking the camera and I'm trying to decide how much is in those containers, it needs to be a liquid or a solid. And the reason why that is I need a vapor space inside that container to be able to tell me how much is in there. We want different temperatures. So the temperature of that vapor space is gonna be a little bit different than what the product is inside that container. We need to understand though, if that container is isolated, if there's two or three layers, I'm probably not gonna be able to get a reading of it. So that could give me information right there telling me I gotta come up with another way and another plan. Again, the limitations of the camera, what does and what doesn't work. When we think of railroad cars, railroad cars could be broken into three sections. By using that camera from a distance, I may be able to tell which part of that railroad car actually has product in it and how much product is in that, that um, container. 
when we are talking about mistakes that happen with the camera, sometimes we get a little cocky while we're moving with the camera. We go for a straight shot instead of staying on the wall, like I talked about a little bit earlier. Make sure you're keeping your landmarks and someone staying on the wall so in case the camera stops working, we still can find our way out of that structure. One of the bad habits that firefighters do with the camera is we pay attention to what's going on in front of us. We don't look up enough. I need to know what's happening above our heads to be able to keep us safe. And if I see those orange and reds and I don't have a way to pull it down, I need to come up with a plan on how I'm gonna get us out of that area or at least shelter us by shutting doors to prevent that fire from getting to flash over temperatures. I have to be able to confirm what I'm seeing. Now we have to remember for downed civilians, depending on how long they're in the building, I should be able to make them out with the camera. But if you have a civilian whose temperatures reach the same temperature as everything else in the room, you're not gonna be able to break down and be able to dissect where they're at in the room because everything's the same temperature. We need to remember that because of the thermal layers, we need to stay low. We need to stay below where those hot signatures are and we need to keep our firefighters safe as we're moving forward. Now when you watch the video, I want you to pay attention to what it looks like when there's water on the ground, what that puddle looks like. Because a hole in the floor can look exactly the same. You could be working in an area that has multiple puddles because water has been used in that area and you could walk right into a hole because you're not crawling. We need to stay low and we need to make sure we don't put ourselves in a situation, whether it's cold smoke or not, where we're gonna have the ability to fall through a hole. So we wanted to say thanks to the firefighters in the Netherlands that are watching this program as we go live, and then we wanted to answer another question. During an automobile accident, and I think it's coming up in Jeff's PowerPoint here, you can use that tick camera to survey the area to check for any occupants that have been ejected from the automobile. Now you can do this just by standing on top of your engine or your tanker if you don't have an aerial device, but if you're in an area where you can get a ladder truck up and overview the whole area, not only will it show you if someone's been ejected, it will show you heat signatures inside the automobile or heat signatures on the motorcycle, so you can determine how many people that you're looking for to make sure you can clear the scene appropriately and not have to come back. And that we show in the video, while the firefighter is actually doing a search in the house, the firefighter puts their hands on a couple of the pieces of furniture and we show you what that heat signature looks like. Now the longer you've been in this, this seat, depending on what the temperatures are in the area, it could leave a bigger heat signature and be there for an extended period of time. So like Timmy said, when you're showing up at auto accidents, if I find one person in the car and I have three heat signatures, I need to spend the time looking in that area. Maybe they're off in the field, maybe they left the scene, but I need to pay attention to that. Some of the cameras that are out there have thermal throttles on them. We're not gonna spend a ton of time talking about thermal th throttles, but what I want you to remember is a thermal throttle is only used for overhaul and investigating things like ballast. You're not gonna use the thermal throttle on your camera while actual firefighting is going on. That is a dangerous thing to do. The easiest way to remember how to use thermal throttle is while you're doing overhaul. If I take that camera and I point it at a firefighter that's standing near me and I make him the bluest thing in the room, I then go back and scan the wall, it's gonna look for the hottest things in the room. If you need to come out of that thermal throttle for any reason, the easiest way to do it, especially with gloved hands, is usually to turn the camera off, turn it back on, and it resets itself. So we're gonna go over some basic tips that I kind of want you to remember before we end, end this portion of the, of the classroom. When you have to wipe your mask inside the structure, remember to wipe both sides of the camera. It's telling you that you're getting fogged up in your mask, your camera's probably getting fogged up too. So we need to wipe the front and back so we make sure we're getting a good heat signature. While we were doing the videos for this class, one of the cameras fogged up real good on the outside of it and we weren't getting any of the colors, just the heat signature. Of, of the temperature gauge on the side. We were getting no colors on the camera until we wiped it off. Remember for your roll call, when you're talking about tips and ways you're gonna be using the camera, make sure your firefighters understand the operations and the functions of how your camera works. 
talk to them and make sure they can use the camera and utilize it during an orientated search. Explain to them the method. And that's something that you can go out and practice today, even in the bunk room. Go over how you're going to do an orientated search with the camera. Talk to them about what advantages a camera can have for you while you're using it at a fire scene, at a hazmat, at an auto accident. Think of other ways you can use that camera to benefit you and make your life easier. Make sure they understand limitations of the camera. That's what's gonna get us in trouble. Not the good things the camera does, the things the camera won't give us information on. And it's about sets and reps. Make sure you're getting practice. Make sure you're going over those things on a regular basis because it is perishable. If you don't practice this, if you don't talk about it, if you don't discuss it, you're not gonna be very good at it. I hope the information that we delivered to you today was helpful. Timmy's gonna to talk to you about the video that we're gonna show in a little bit. If you're interested in finding out and getting the opportunity to work with the camera in a bunch of different buildings in a bunch of different settings, make sure you come to Fire College in October or think about Winter Fire School. You have an opportunity to get a ton of sets and reps with the cameras that you use at home. Timmy? Hey, a couple few things before we tidy up for the day, guys and girls. The video that we're going to show you this afternoon replicates fire training using the oriented search and the tick camera is a tool. It's not a fire uh, suppression video. The speed of the video is slowed down for teaching purposes and we purposely allowed some blank airspace in there so that you can teach and talk in your own department about the way that you want to use that camera. Uh, we also had one question about how can I train with my camera now with what's going on with COVID-19. That's easy. Jeff just talked about it a little bit. Put your SCVA on, put your face piece on, take your hood up in the bunk room, black out your face piece, put your officer, who's ever going to run that camera, out there with the camera and have him or her run an oriented search in your bunk room. Hide a hammer in there, hide a sledgehammer, hide a fire tool, anything that you have in the firehouse, a piece of cake if that's what gets it done. Whatever you guys can do to find, and then if you find the piece of cake, you get to eat it. There's all kinds of training that you can do in the firehouse during the COVID-19 response. Please refer back to our COVID-19 videos, six of them that will help you uh, provide better service to you and your citizens in your local locality. Also, we posted on our portal page, public assistance documents. Make sure that your chief officers see those and work with their city managers and their county emergency managers so that you can get reimbursed for what you're doing. Make sure you post any questions on this website at fsi-covid19questions at illinois.edu. And then make sure you join me, Ronnie Raines, and Chief Tom Schubert for Rural Fire Command on April 30th. We'll be coming to you live from the Dirty Classroom, and that's a class that I'm gonna be sitting in because I have no experience in Rural Command. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for joining us on the forum and the video 